today we're going to start talking about World War I, which has several different names, sometimes called the Great War or the War to End All Wars. And um, this PowerPoint is a little long, so we're going to probably divide it over two days. First, we're going to go over the causes of World War I, and you can fill in uh, a little explanation for each of the spaces on your page. So first were national rivalries. It's important to remember at this point in Europe in the early 20th century that Europeans are still very, very competitive. So they have just recently colonized Africa in the late 1800s, where there was a lot of rivalry and competition over territory and resources, and that really continues. Britain and Germany were especially competitive with each other. There's also competition for resources. So like I just mentioned, they were competing for territory and resources throughout the world. Uh, and this intensified because by this point, most of the land available for colonization was already taken. So I mean, the Americas are independent. Uh, Asia, uh, China, East Asia area is not being colonized. Africa is colonized, so there's really not a lot of other places for them to focus this really competitive energy that they have. Another cause is aggressive nationalism, especially within multinational or imperialist empires. So remember, nationalism is pride in one's country or wanting to have a nation for one's own group of people. And in large multi-ethnic empires like Austria-Hungary, um, there were a lot of different ethnic minorities that did not have their own nation. And so that caused tensions between specific groups. Examples would be the Slavs in Austria-Hungary. So Slavs are people from Eastern Europe. These are people who um, want to have their own nation not be under Austria, which is like a German-speaking uh, government. They want to have a nation for their own people, and Austria-Hungary doesn't want that to happen. The same thing would be true for the Poles in Russia. So um, Poland, at by this point, it had been divided up in the late 1700s among European countries. And so the Poles are under the control of Russia, but they're not Russian-speaking. They don't have the same culture as Russia. And so they would like to have a nation for their own people as well. So nationalism and different ethnic minorities wanting their own country definitely contributed to the tension that led to World War I. Another cause is imperialist expansion. So I just talked about how uh, imperialism led to increased competition between European powers, but it also made this war more global and more deadly. So if you'd like to, you can pause the video and talk as a class about how this could help a country win in war, the fact that uh, these European nations had these huge empires throughout the world. And hopefully one of the things that you talked about is the fact that they have access to more resources and more people to potentially help them in war than ever before because they have these global overseas empires. Another cause of the war is growth of military power or militarism. So it's just important to understand that at this time in Europe, the early late 1800s, early 1900s, there was an intense buildup of military power among the European countries. So there's so much tension in Europe that it's almost a matter of like when is there going to be a war, not if there's going to be a war. And so these different nations want to be prepared. They don't want to be the one nation that's caught off guard and doesn't have their military ready to go. And so as a result, they are building up their militaries a lot in preparation for this time period. So you can write down just a few examples of what this looked like. Uh, you don't necessarily have to write down all of these. So the institution of conscription in most European nations, that's the draft. So mandatory military service was instituted in a lot of these countries. Military sizes, as a result, doubled between 1890 and 1914 in Europe. Russia had the largest military in terms of size and number of men, but you can kind of keep in mind what we've learned about Russia in the past and how they've struggled to adapt to the modern world as quickly as Western Europe has, and that's definitely going to play a role. Many countries also had detailed plans of attack in case of war. So 
like I said, they Europeans kind of feel like war is inevitable, but they don't necessarily know exactly who they're going to go to war against. And so a lot of the militaries developed plans of attack for every possible scenario they could think of. Like if we go to war against this country, here's what we're going to do against this country. Here's our strategy. They developed all these possible scenarios that they'd be ready to respond to. Also, new weapons and technologies were developed. And we'll learn about those later on in this PowerPoint, but the new weapons and technologies made this the deadliest war ever um, because they were using weapons that caused um, just so much death and destruction compared to previous wars. And then also naval power grew. So Britain, of course, is the one that's known for having the strongest navy in the world, um, but this is something that other countries were investing in at the time as well, countries like Germany, and we'll talk about that. And then lastly, another major cause is the alliance systems. And this is really important to understand. So make sure that you write down the alliances and which countries are involved. Um, and they also have different names, which can be a little confusing. So the Triple Entente includes Great Britain, France, and Russia. They are also called the Allies during the war. The Triple Alliance is called, um, includes Germany, Austria-Hungary, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire. They are also called the Central Powers. So it's important to know those two alliance systems. If you need to pause the video to finish writing them down, go ahead and do that. All right, so what exactly led to the outbreak of war? So we're going to do the chain reaction of events that started World War I. The region that's important to understand for the start of World War I is the Balkans, which is circled on this map. So the Balkan Peninsula had been a place where there had been war in 1912 and 1913, due to nationalist pressures within the Ottoman Empire and Austria-Hungary. So like I talked about a few minutes ago, in this region, there were lots of different ethnic minorities. Um, they were Some of them were within the Ottoman Empire. Some of them were within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But these different ethnic minorities want to have their own nation. They don't want to be Austrian. They don't want to be Ottoman. And so this had caused warfare in this region as people fought against fought for their own nation, and these empires tried to prevent them from doing that, um, and the different nationalities fought over territory. And so the Balkans are often referred to as the powder keg of Europe, meaning there's so much tension here, all it's going to take is just one spark, and the whole thing's going to blow up into a major war, which really is exactly what happened. So Serbia, which you see on the map, had previously become independent from the Ottomans, and they wanted to expand their borders and include Slavic minorities from Austria-Hungary. So the Serbs are part of this larger Eastern, ethnic, or Eastern European ethnic group called the Slavs, and there's a lot of Slavic people within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, especially in that southern part, who feel nationalism, and they would like to break away and join up with other Slavic people and form an official Slavic homeland. One of the things that Austria-Hungary did during this time was it annexed a territory next to Serbia called Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, Bosnia and Herzegovina also contained Slavic people, and so Serbia saw this as an affront and very offensive to what Serbia was trying to do because they're trying to form this large Slavic nation for Slavic people and Austria-Hungary is annexing this territory to send the message like, no, you're not going to, you better watch out. Um, we're here and we're a large empire and we're not going to allow you to just kind of do whatever you want. Now, Russia, which is in the kind of like magenta color at the top right corner of the map, um, also has a lot of Slavic people. And so Russia was loosely allied with Serbia, but also not really interested in going to war. Um, so Russia kind of has a promise to defend Serbia, but at the same time, they're not really interested in going to war against another large empire like Austria-Hungary at this time. So the actual spark that lit the powder keg and started the war uh, is the visit of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He's the heir of Austria-Hungary's throne, and he visited their new territory of Bosnia. So Bosnia had been annexed by Austria-Hungary, 
And so the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary goes to pay a visit there to kind of like officially say you're in the empire now. Um, And so he takes this trip there. The Serbs know that this is happening. And so um, a group of Serbs belonging to a terrorist organization called the Black Hand plotted to assassinate Franz Ferdinand as retaliation for Austria's annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, And so um, they shot him as he was traveling in this car with his wife while he was visiting Bosnia. And so the next question is, how is Austria-Hungary going to respond to this? Because the heir to their throne has just been assassinated. And at the time, nobody fully knew, like, if Serbia was behind this, if it was the government, whatever. But it's a good excuse for Austria-Hungary to kind of try to eliminate the problem of Serbia once and for all. So Austria-Hungary's response, they wanted to attack Serbia and destroy the Slavic nationalist movements. They don't want this thing to keep going where Serbia continues to want to take territory and build a Slavic nation. Austria-Hungary would prefer to just destroy Serbia and eliminate this problem that they've been dealing with. Now, the only issue for them is that Austria-Hungary is worried that Russia is going to come defend the Slavic people of Serbia because they have this loose alliance. And so they're not exactly sure what Russia will do, but it's definitely something that they need to consider. And so... Austria-Hungary goes to its ally of Germany. So go back and look at the alliances, and you'll notice that in the Triple Alliance, Austria-Hungary and Germany are on the same side, right? And so um, Austria-Hungary goes to Germany and asks for help. Like, if we go and attack Serbia and Russia is drawn into the war, will you back us up as our ally? And Germany gave them what we call a blank check, um, which if you give someone a blank check metaphorically, it's like saying... I'm here for whatever you need. I'll back you up in any way I can. So once Austria-Hungary has that from Germany, they feel confident in launching um, war against Serbia. And so on July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. In response to this, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia ordered the mobilization of the Russian military. So he's not attacking anybody, but he's saying, I'm going to get my troops ready and probably move them closer to the border um, in anticipation of what might happen. And so a couple of days later, Germany declared war on Russia after warning it not to mobilize. So Germany said, we see you moving our, your troops closer to our border. Um, this is very threatening to us. And so if you don't stop, then we're going to take it as an act of war, which is exactly what happened. So this brings into play militarism. So Germany, once it declared war on Russia, it activated its military plans. And remember that I said they had a plan for every possible situation, and this was based on the alliances that were already developed. So this plan that Germany um, initiated was called the Schlieffen Plan. Now, to understand the Schlieffen Plan, we need to talk about who were Russia's allies. Um, So go ahead and pause the video and discuss those two questions. So because Russia has allies of Britain and France, it realizes that if it goes to war, um, if Germany goes to war against Russia, it's going to be fighting Britain and France as well. And this is going to result in a two-front war where they're going to be fighting against Britain and France on the west, and they're going to be fighting against Russia on the east. Who do you think Germany viewed as the biggest threat? Well, I don't know what you guys discussed, but in this time period, they viewed Russia as the biggest threat because Russia is this huge empire. And even though we know that Russia was behind in its military technology, um, it still had the largest military in Europe. So it had the largest number of men in its military. And so Germany feels like Russia is going to be the big issue once it goes to war. So this plan called for a two-front war. Now, it's important to realize that Germany at this point is only at war against Russia, right? They've declared war on Russia because Russia mobilized their troops. And Germany is just assuming that Britain and France are going to quickly enter the war um, to aid Russia. And so this plan that they already have in place says that since Russia is going to be the bigger threat, Germany is going to try to hold off Russia in the east for a little while 
and then quickly defeat Britain and France in the West, and then they can focus all of their attention back on the Eastern side. So the Schlieffen plan said, like you see in the map uh, at the top, that Germany should quickly invade France through Belgium and defeat France, which they think is going to be not so much of a problem. Then once they do that, they can send all their soldiers and resources back over to the east to fight against Russia. Now the problem here, again, is that they're invading countries that they are not yet at war against. I mean, now they are that they've invaded, but they had no... um, declaration of war against those countries prior to activating this plan. So to initiate the Schlieffen plan, on August 3rd, 1914, Germany declared war on France and invaded through Belgium. The next day, Great Britain declared war on Germany for invading neutral Belgium and also to defend its alliance. So it's important to see here how the alliance systems drew these countries into the war that were not even a part of the conflict. So, I mean, this all started with Slavic nationalism in the Balkans, which Russia and Austria-Hungary were interested in, but it really had not much to do with Britain and France, and now they're involved in the war due to the system of alliances and the military plans that had been previously developed. So I think it's good to pause and just discuss the two-front war happening here. So on the Western front, we have Germany and Austria-Hungary, but mostly Germany, versus Great Britain and France. So over here on the lines kind of going through Northeast France, Germany is fighting against Great Britain and France. On the Eastern front, we have Russia fighting against Germany and Austria-Hungary. So go ahead and make sure you record that information. So at the beginning of the war, people were pretty optimistic because most Europeans believed their country was in the right, and so they thought this would be a pretty quick war. They supported their country and thought they would be able to defeat their enemies, and it would be over relatively quickly. And so in 1914, 20 million men headed off to war, um, and you can see from these images, like, they were pretty optimistic about the situation. The Germans, again, counted on quickly defeating France so they could return and focus on Russia in the east. That did not play out. So what happened is that they got stuck fighting in northeastern France. They were unable to reach Paris and quickly defeat France. So now they're fighting a true two-front war, which is what they had hoped to avoid um, with the Schlieffen plan. So go ahead and pause the video here. The videos will not play within this video, um, but this one is about new tactics and new weapons. So on your paper, go ahead and list all the new tactics and weapons that you um, hear about through the video. One of the tactics that you should record under the Western Front and also under new tactics is trench warfare. So this occurred in Northeastern France on the Western Front. As they got stuck, the Germans got stuck um, moving through France, what happened is that both sides dug trenches parallel to each other through northeastern France. And so they dug trenches to protect themselves. They um, protected them with barbed wire and um, would try to fight each other basically from the trenches. This meant that the battle lines remained relatively unchanged for years. And this turned into what we call a war of attrition. So generally in a war, you're trying to capture territory. That's the idea. Like that's what the Germans wanted to do. They wanted to invade and get all the way to Paris and capture France. Um, But in a war of attrition, you're pretty much just trying to wear the other side down until they give up. Um, And so the war turned into a stalemate with very heavy casualties on both sides. Because the strategy of trench warfare is that you bombard the other side with artillery. You bomb the other side to try to weaken them. When you feel like you've weakened them sufficiently, then you send your men out of the trench across the middle area um, called no man's land, the area in the middle of the trenches, um, to try to go attack them in the other trench. Now, the problem with this strategy is that the people on the other side in the other trench are protected. Um, They're down in the trench shooting at you with machine guns as you're running across. And so, as you can imagine, it generally did not accomplish much. Another problem with the trenches is the terrible living conditions. So if you I mean if you just look at these pictures, um, you can see that that the men lived in really squalid conditions. 
Um, when it rained, the trenches filled up with water. Um, they went to the bathroom in the trenches. So a lot of diseases and things um, spread in the trenches. Foot funguses was a major were a major problem. Trench foot was the name that they assigned to those kinds of diseases. Um, so it really um, was a bad system, and the war just turned into a stalemate on the Western Front. The key thing to understand about the new weapons and new tactics is that the new weapons uh, were more deadly than weapons that had ever been used in warfare before. Uh, and so that's why this war resulted in more deaths than any war previously. And these pictures illustrate the tactics of trench warfare, where the men are coming out of their trench, crossing the area in the middle called no man's land, um, and being shot at by the other side who are protected down in their trench. And so the war, again, on the Western Front turned into a stalemate due to the tactics of trench warfare. So here's a list of some of the new weapons that it would be good for you to know. Um, you can pause this if you'd like to and fill in this list. I'm sure a lot of them you already wrote down from the video. Other new tactics included bombing civilians. So previously, if you think about wars, um, a war that I think is easy to picture in your minds would maybe be like the American Revolution, where the two sides came and fought each other lined up in a field. Um, they knew kind of when the battle was going to take place and all of that. They weren't necessarily attacking, openly attacking people in cities, civilians who were not involved. Bombing civilians became a new tactic in World War I, and the purpose of that was really to destroy the morale of the other side. So think about how the Western Front descended into a stalemate, um, and neither side was really winning or losing much. They tried to bomb each other to try to destroy the other's will to fight. Naval blockades were also set up to try to starve the enemy out. Um, so Britain and Germany both used naval blockades against each other to try to prevent each other from getting enough food and supplies. And submarine warfare was one of the major tactics used. So go ahead and watch this video. Again, you'll have to pause it for a minute and then go to the video and then come back. Um, so go ahead and watch the video, discuss it, and then you can come back to the, this video and keep going. So again, the casualties of World War I are just very high because of these new tactics and weapons. Um, two particularly bloody battles that tried to break the stalemate were at Verdun in France and the Somme. And it, you don't need to know these specific battles, but I just want you to look at how many people died in just these individual battles. And again, that's because of the new technology and the tactics that were used in World War I. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Eastern Front. Um, the Eastern Front changed much more frequently than the Western Front. They were not using trench warfare on the Eastern Front. Now, remember that Germany had viewed Russia as the biggest threat. And what ended up happening is that Russia suffered several defeats and was losing more men than any other nation in the war. This made the war very unpopular in Russia. And here we have a photograph of Tsar Nicholas II, he insisted on leading the troops into battle himself from Russia, even though he did not really have military experience. Uh, and this image, I think, really shows um, kind of part of the reason why he was pretty inept. So he's holding um, a religious icon, and you might remember icons are religious images of saints and things like that. And so you can see the men are bowing down and praying. Um, so it kind of symbolizes maybe what he was relying on rather than his own um, military experience, of which he had very little. So the next section is about total war. World War I is considered one of the first total wars because it completely mobilized all resources and civilians to help with the war effort. So that's the definition. A total war is kind of in the name. Everyone, so total, the total of the people are involved in fighting this war, even the civilians. So all resources, civilians, everyone is mobilized to help with the war effort. So some examples. A lot of these countries in Europe rationed food and supplies. So they had to limit what people were able to buy at home to make sure that they had enough food and supplies to send to the soldiers. The governments of a lot of these countries took over the economy. Um, and so 
a lot of these countries, like Britain, for example, had a market economy. The government played a much larger role in the economy in controlling what was produced during the war. So, for example, they took over factories that maybe were producing household items and turned them into factories that now are producing military supplies. The governments also a lot of times set prices and wages to try to control the economy. And another form of government control would be conscription, um, where people were drafted into the military um, and mandatory military service. So since this is a total war, everyone is going to be utilized, including women. As the men went off to work as soldiers, um, women worked in the factories to produce weapons, and they worked in other government jobs. So um, office jobs, they worked as nurses and clerks in the military. Women played a very active role in doing jobs that a lot of times were previously done by men now that the men were off fighting. Um, as a result of this, of women's uh, participation in the war effort, it's important to note that in a lot of these countries in Europe, women gained the right to vote following the war because they had proven that they were such valuable members of society. So as the war dragged on and on, governments had to take action to keep public opinion in support of the war. And so um, I know you already know governments actively use propaganda to keep up support for the dragging war. Um, government censored newspapers and exaggerated atrocities by the other side. So even governments that were democratic before the war definitely controlled people's rights and limited people's rights in order to um, maintain support for the war as it went on and on. So here are just some specific examples of governments that had a democracy prior to the war um, that limited freedom. So in Great Britain, they passed the Defense of the Realm Act. This meant that um, newspapers um, and different periodicals could be censored by the government, and they could also prosecute dissenters. So like people who published articles that were critical of the war um, could be prosecuted under this act. So it was a way of uh, more tightly controlling public opinion. Um, and then France um, and George Clemenceau suspended civil liberties and enforced censorship. So basically, European countries limited freedoms during the war to help them control public opinion. And so on the next few slides, there are propaganda posters. These are mostly from Britain. I think they're all from either Britain or the United States. And I did that just because they're in English and so we can easily understand them. Um, I also know that you guys have seen these before. Um, so you can kind of decide as a class how much time you want to spend talking about each one. Here are some more. So on the one on the left, you can talk about who is this aimed towards? Um, what might be exaggerated here? What's the message? Think about the same thing on the one on the right. Who is this geared towards? Who would really be um, dealing with food and things like that on the home front? So go ahead and pause and discuss. Here are some more. So go ahead and talk about the one on the left. Who do you think is the menace of the seas and what does that mean? Talk about the one on the right. Who's the Hun? What's happening in this image? Um, and who do you think the audience is and what is exaggerated? And then here's two last ones. The one on the left is from Great Britain, so you can discuss that. Who's the audience? What's the message? And then the one on the right, I just like to include because it's a really famous poster that I'm sure most of us have seen, and you may not have realized that this is from World War I. So go ahead and pause, and you can discuss those. Another part of total war is the utilization of colonies. So we talked at the beginning about how imperialism played a role in World War I, Colonies were very important to the European powers for supplying resources, including soldiers. Um, so here we have Indian soldiers who are marching off um, as part of the British military to go fight in World War I. This also meant that the war was fought secondarily on other fronts, um, and often the Europeans attacked each other's colonies. So, for example, the Allies attacked German African colonies, and the soldiers that fought on those fronts as well in Europe, as in Europe included Europeans, but also Africans and Indians. And so here we have soldiers from Northern Africa 
um, from, I believe, French colonies who became involved in the war. Here's yet another example. So at the famous um, Battle of Gallipoli, the Allies attacked the Ottoman Empire, hoping to capture Istanbul, which we've talked about before was a very strategic location. Um, the Allies lost, and a lot of the soldiers who fought on behalf of especially the British had come from their overseas colonies, places like Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. So the idea here is that with total war, Europeans are interested in um, using their colonial people as soldiers in the war and also taking resources from their colonies to help them in their war efforts. Another thing to note regarding colonies uh, that a lot of people don't know is that Japan actually joined up with the Allies in 1914 as a way to go after German colonies in the Pacific. So Japan during the early 20th century was becoming an imperialist nation and after it went through the Meiji Restoration and rapid industrialization in Japan, uh, they were desperate for natural resources. And so this is one of the things that's just a, a little fact to keep in mind as we move into um, the aftermath of World War I and into World War II, um, that Japan is expanding in the Pacific and they use World War I to their advantage in order to try to do that. Another important event to history occurred during World War I, which is the Armenian Genocide. So the Ottoman Empire, remember, is on the side in the war of Germany and Austria-Hungary. They're part of the Triple Alliance or the Central Powers. And we also know by this point that the Ottoman Empire is really falling apart. So the Ottomans have a lot of different ethnic groups within the Ottoman Empire who know that the Ottoman Empire is in decline and would like to break off and form their own nation. And so um, nationalist feelings within the Ottoman Empire led to the persecution of Armenian Orthodox Christians. One of the groups within the Ottoman Empire that were becoming very prominent and were going to probably be the new leaders of whatever state came after the Ottoman Empire were the Turks. They were the majority group. And so within the, with the increasing power of the Turkish majority, the Armenians were viewed as traitors against the establishment of a Turkish Muslim state. So the Turks wanted to be the new leaders of the Ottoman Empire after the Ottoman Empire fell, um, but there were these ethnic minorities, the Armenians, who were Christian, um, and so um, they were persecuted for their religious beliefs. Thousands of the Armenians were forced to flee Ottoman territory, so some of them tried to escape and go to other parts of Europe. A lot of them died along their journey. Thousands died of starvation and harsh conditions. Other Armenians were rounded up and executed by the government. And so the Armenian genocide lasted um, from about 1815 to, sorry, 1915 to 1917. And it's estimated that about a million Armenians died. Another key event is the withdrawal of Russia from the war. So in 1917, Russia underwent a communist revolution where Tsar Nicholas II was overthrown and the Bolsheviks established a new communist state. Now, we're going to do a whole separate lesson on this, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what happened. Um, but the Bolshevik leaders knew that the war was very unpopular in Russia because Russia was losing so many men. Um, their soldiers did not have enough supplies or weapons to keep going. And so the Bolshevik leaders, part of their promise in taking over was to end Russia's involvement with the war. So the Bolsheviks negotiated peace with Germany and Austria-Hungary to end Russia's fighting in 1917. From this point on, the war was focused then on the Western Front. Um, and this map just shows, or this chart just shows you um, the deaths of the Entente powers or the Allies. And you can see that Russia by far has the most deaths. And so that led to the war being very unpopular. Once they had the communist revolution, Russia pulled out, and now the war is centered mostly on the Western Front. This map shows you the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which is the treaty that Lenin signed with Germany and Austria-Hungary to get out of the war. And you can see that Russia gave up a tremendous amount of territory here. So the orange land is the land that they gave up to Germany. The green is what they gave up to Austria-Hungary in order to exit the war. Now, Lenin told the people that this was totally fine because 
Um, he believed that communism was going to spread, like the revolution was just going to keep going. And so this land would become part eventually of this huge communist state that he believed was going to be created, which didn't actually come to fruition, but that's how he um, got support for this treaty. Another key event is the entry of the United States into the war. So the attitude of Americans towards the war when it started is one of isolationism. Americans really felt like those Europeans are always fighting each other. This really has nothing to do with us, and most Americans did not want to be involved. However, the U.S. benefited from the war before it started because the U.S. sold supplies to both sides. The U.S. definitely sold more to the Allies, and I would say that's because the U.S. already had more established trading relationships with countries like Great Britain. But the U.S. was actively involved in supplying um, all different countries that were involved in the war. So why did the U.S. then turn from isolationism and get involved? Um, unrestricted submarine warfare is a big issue here. So the Germans used their U-boats to patrol the Atlantic, and they were trying to find any ships that were aiding the enemy. And so this included cargo ships that they believed were selling supplies to aid countries like Great Britain and France. So the unrestricted part means they are willing to fire on not just military ships, but on any kind of ship that they feel like is aiding the enemy. In 1915, the German U-boats uh, torpedoed a ship called the Lusitania, which was mostly a passenger ship, but did have cargo um, on it as well. And on the Lusitania were about 100 Americans who died um, as a result of the attack of this ship. Um, and this caused huge outrage in the United States because, again, um, to the Americans, why is, why is Germany firing on this ship that is mostly just a passenger ship um, and killing these innocent people that have nothing to do with the war? Um, and so the United States protested the unrestricted submarine warfare. And for a while, Germany agreed to kind of back off of that policy. Another issue um, is the Zimmerman telegram. The Zimmerman telegram was an intercept from um, supposedly from Germany to Mexico, um, asking Mexico to consider uh, invading the United States to distract the United States from possibly entering the war. And in return for that, Germany promised that Mexico would get back territory that it had lost previously in the Southwest, like areas like Texas. Now, whether or not this was legitimate or anyone was ever going to take action on it, it surfaced in the American media and again caused outrage among people in the United States. So both of these issues led to the entry of the United States into the war. And later on, Germany resumed its unrestricted submarine warfare, and that was really the final straw for the U.S. So on April 6, 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany. This was really significant for the Allies because by early 1918, Europe was really worn out from the war. Um, there were a lot of rebellions and riots among soldiers, also among civilians, as shortages from the war um, continued to really impact people's lives, soldiers mutinied. There were also nationalist revolts. So don't forget about all those different ethnic minorities, especially in Eastern Europe, who wanted their independence. So the war was really devastating Europe, and yet it seemed like it was just going to go on and on and on. So by um, the end of 1918, Germany was really running out of money and supplies to keep fighting the war, and so after the entry of the United States. And so the German general Ludendorff asked the government to surrender. They found out, however, that the Allies were unwilling to negotiate with um, the autocratic state of Germany, and so the people within Germany revolted, which forced the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm, who you remember from um, the time of Otto von Bismarck. He's actually the one that fired Otto von Bismarck. And they revolted and formed a republic. This became known as the Weimar Republic, and that's the um, democratic government of Germany following World War I. And so once that happened, um, they signed an armistice to end fighting on November 11th, 1918. So before we go on too far, let's start filling in your paper on the page that says the Paris Peace Conference. So Germany signed an armistice to end the fighting on November 11th, 1918. The winners of the war were Great Britain, France, 
and the United States. And the war ended in 1918. We don't include Russia because, remember, Russia had already pulled out of the war in 1917 and they'd negotiated their own treaties already. The losers of the war were Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And so the winners met at Versailles, which is outside of Paris, to establish a peace settlement. And the final peace treaty with Germany was called the Treaty of Versailles. Now, I'm going to go through what each side wanted and then what was ultimately included. Um, and so you're going to fill in what each leader from each country wants and then what was actually included in the final Treaty of Versailles with Germany. You may want to pause the video as you go because it's a lot of information. So feel free to pause if you need more time to write. All right, France's main motivation was to punish Germany. Why might this be the case? So you might want to pause the video and discuss this. Think about the location of the fighting and what that might have had to do with it. So one of the major things to think about is that most of the trench warfare took place in France. And so France was especially devastated by this war because so much of the fighting took place on French territory. The French wanted to strip Germany of their weapons. They wanted Germany to pay large reparations, which is payment for all the damages that the war had caused. And they wanted to create the Rhineland as a buffer state. The Rhineland is this region of Germany that borders France, and they wanted Germany to not be allowed to have any military activity in the Rhineland on the border with France to hopefully prevent any kind of future attack on France. Great Britain had a more moderate view. So they definitely wanted reparations, um, but they were more moderate than France. They didn't hold this strongest view that France should be like, or that Germany should be totally destroyed and um, stripped of everything due to the war. Mostly they're focused on reparations. And then the USA was led by, at the time, President Wilson. And President Wilson had given a speech before he even went to the Paris Peace Conference outlining um, what were the major things that the USA should try to seek out of this peace conference. And this was called the 14 points. So it was like the 14 main things that he thought were important. So you definitely don't need to know all of them, but here are some of the important things that he wanted included. He wanted no secret agreements. So think about how the alliances had drawn in all these countries into the war. And so President Wilson feels like that kind of system is kind of dangerous, and so he wants to prevent that in the future. Freedom of the seas and free trade. So remember one of the major issues that caused the U.S. to enter the war was the unrestricted submarine warfare. And so he wants um, to prevent something like that from happening in the future. Reduce military sizes. So remember, militarism was a big cause of the war, so he wants to get at that. He also wanted a League of Nations. A League of Nations was supposed to be a place where countries could come together and talk and discuss and resolve disputes before war actually took place. So this was like so going to be kind of like an early um, United Nations, that kind of idea. And then he also wanted self-determination. Self-determination is the right of a group of people to choose their own future. So here he's thinking about those nationalist groups within Europe who want their own country. And he's saying that a lot of these groups of people should be able to choose what happens to them in the future. So one thing to notice here is that the goals of the United States are more maybe like idealistic or philosophical rather than tangible things. Like France wants punishment and money and payback. The U.S. wants to like um, prevent future war, that kind of thing. And the U.S. has a very different viewpoint on this, and I think there's two main reasons for that. Number one, none of the fighting took place in the United States. So the U.S. did not experience the same level of destruction by any means that a country like France did. And then also remember, the U.S. was in the war for a relatively short period of time. So the U.S. Um, did not lose as many soldiers, for example, by any means um, as the other countries did. And so the U.S. just has a very different viewpoint on what should happen through this peace agreement. So here's what was included in the final peace treaty. Now, 
Each country had their own treaty. This final treaty that we're going to focus on is the Treaty of Versailles, which was the peace treaty with Germany. And that the reason we focus on that is because it really led to future events like World War II, which we're going to study. And so it's the one that's most important to understand, to have an understanding of uh, the full results of World War I. And so I'm going to go through this again. If you feel like you need to pause the video to be able to write these things down, that's fine. Um, try to abbreviate as much as you can. So here's what the treaty said. Germany was not allowed to have a navy or air force. They had to dramatically reduce the size of their military. They're not allowed to have any future alliances with Austria. They have to pay huge amounts of reparations or money to the other countries. They lost territory. The Rhineland was a demilitarized zone. So just pause for a second, even if you're writing, and look at the map. The Rhineland is the striped area on the map. So notice it's part of Germany, but it's supposed to be a demilitarized zone. So that means Germany can't have any weapons or soldiers in that region, and that's supposed to prevent or protect France from future attack. That's important just to realize because when we get to World War II and talk about that, we're going to see um, the role that the Rhineland plays in that and how Hitler violated this treaty. And then the last thing is Article 231, or the War Guilt Clause. This said that Germany um, had to accept blame for the war and basically said that Germany caused the whole war. So I'd like you to pause and talk about that for a minute. Look back over how the war started and discuss whether or not you think that's a true statement. So hopefully you realize that's not a true statement, um, and that was a really humiliating thing for Germany to have to sign this treaty that said that it was all their fault, when that's really not at all what happened. Uh, and so that caused a lot of resentment um, for Germany in the future. All right, um, when you're done writing, at the bottom there are some questions to discuss about future conflict. So go ahead and discuss the future conflict box about the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and you can pause the video and then when you're ready, you can move on. So Germany treated or viewed this treaty as extremely harsh. Um, and you've probably already talked about which parts you think would have bothered the Germans the most. What happened to Austria-Hungary? Well, Austria-Hungary ceased to exist. So if you look at this map, all the new countries that were created after World War I are in pink. And you can see Austria-Hungary was divided into Austria, Hungary, and then this new state called Yugoslavia. Um, on your paper, it also talks about why would new countries created after war cause future conflicts. You can discuss that now, or you might want to come back at the end and discuss that once I talk more about some of these future nations. So let's go over the major effects of World War I. It caused huge amounts of death and destruction. And we talked about how the new tactics and new weapons of the war um, very much contributed to that. They allowed people to, be, to kill many more people more quickly um, due to all this new technology and these new weapons. And then also, I mean, it just caused a lot of destruction of land. Um, and so it took a while for these countries, for their economies to recover, um, especially a country like France, uh, after the war was over. And then self-determination. Remember, self-determination is this idea that President Wilson promoted, that people should have the right to choose their own destiny. So it's really going along with nationalism. And so there are two empires that fell as a result of World War I. Austria-Hungary was divided up, which I talked about before. And then the Ottoman Empire also fell after the war. So on this map... Um, the new countries are in pink. The countries of the Ottoman Empire are not in pink, even though really they should be. Um, so countries like Turkey, that was a new country after the war as the Ottoman Empire fell. Um, and so self-determination led to a lot of new nations for some of these different ethnic groups. So it says on your paper to put a star on the map after for all the countries, the new countries that were created. So you can see... They include Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, 
and Turkey. And Yugoslavia was like supposed to be that Slavic state. If you remember at the beginning, we talked about how Serbia wanted to create a nation for Slavic people. And so Yugoslavia was supposed to be like the um, solution to all of that. Um, what future problems could this cause? Well, it's important to note that not all of the ethnic groups in Europe got their own country after the war. So Yugoslavia, for example, there were many different Slavic ethnic groups within Yugoslavia, and some of them wanted their own nation. Um, there's other groups that did not get their own specific nation um, out of this peace treaty. And so not everybody is satisfied by the new map that is drawn. And here's an example of that. So this is an ethnic map of Yugoslavia. Um, and you can see that there's many different ethnic groups within Yugoslavia. So even though it achieved the goal of a Slavic state, you still have these different groups who are going to be vying for who's the most powerful and who's really in charge. Um, and you can see, even if we wanted to make a country for all of these different ethnic groups, it would be really challenging. Like Bosnia and Herzegovina have a lot of Serbs, Bosnians, and Croats all within that area mixed together. And so this eventually will cause future conflicts. So you may have learned last year in World Geography about um, the Balkans Wars of the 1990s and the issues with that that are a direct result of how Yugoslavia was formed in this time period. Another effect is the setup of the mandate system. So the German colonies uh, throughout the world in places like Africa and some of the former Ottoman territory were turned into mandates of the allies. A mandate officially is saying that these territories are going to be governed by the League of Nations, but they're going to be under the protection of the British and the French. So technically, they're not supposed to be colonies of the British and the French, but I would say essentially they're just colonies of the British and the French. So technically, they're saying these are under the government of the League of Nations, and the British and the French are just going to watch over them, but they're essentially colonies of the British and the French. Um, what problems would this cause in this region? Well, these are countries. Remember, the Ottoman Empire um, was falling apart, and there were different ethnic groups within the Ottoman Empire that wanted their own nation. Um, that is not what happened. So Turkey became an independent nation, but these other countries, like Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, essentially became colonies of the Europeans. So the Europeans are really kind of saying here, um, you're not able to govern yourselves. Even though you were part of the Ottoman Empire and governed yourselves for 500 years, um, you're not really ready to be an independent country. You need guidance of Europeans over you. And so this would cause, hopefully you're thinking, nationalism um, in these regions, and it's going to cause future conflict between the Middle East and the West. So to continue on the theme of nationalism, nationalism in the colonies rose dramatically. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video and discuss this question, why would many colonial people believe they deserve to be free after World War I? So hopefully you talked about all the contributions that the colonial people made. Not only are they providing resources, but they sent men who fought and died fighting this European war. And so people in places like India, Africa, other parts of Asia feel like they have proven themselves to the Europeans, that they um, are strong people, that they can contribute, and that they have earned their independence, um, which for the most part is really not what happened after the war, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So that is the end of this um, and the effects of World War I, um, and I'll see you on the next PowerPoint.